Hi Philip, thanks for doing the rebuttal and please excuse my uh, looking up occasionally. I'm trying out a teleprompter for this one just so I try and keep the running time down. So excuses if I'm not making eye contact, it's nothing personal mate. Anyway, uh, thanks for that recent rebuttal and uh, for taking the time late at night when we returned from a Living Colour gig. I'm glad you enjoyed it and I'm going to be coming back to that Living Colour gig later on so stick around for that. I want to begin my summation by talking about what I'm calling ideal truths and everyday truths. As we've spoken about before, the ideal truth statement, or at least if I've talked about it before, the ideal truth statement in the scientific realist myth is one which is true for everyone, in any place, at any time. And more than that, it's one which would be true even if there were no one around to discover it, to recognise it and to build on it. Perhaps it would be true even prior to the existence of the material circumstances to which it referred. Did the truths about carbon bonds exist in a universe before carbon? I don't know, intuitively, objectively, I think yes. You may disagree. Contrast this with the partial, contingent and temporary truths of lived experience. Your liking of living colour is true for you and presumably for a few others, at that moment in time and in space. Nevertheless, it's true, isn't it? Possibly even true with a greater level of certainty than you could hope to achieve in a laboratory. Is there ever truth in poetry? Do you ever listen to the lyrics of a song and think, that's so true? Have you ever seen an artwork and recognised that it's generating in you an understanding a meaning that was not there before, and which you know intuitively to be true. Now what are we to do with those truths? Is this just an abuse of language, and the word true should be reserved only for the results of double-blind, peer-reviewed, single variable experiments that have been reproduced innumerable times, and even then only after we added the caveat that this is just true enough? Are these other truths, these everyday truths, at best, lesser truths? Is your claim that you enjoyed the living colour gig only, at best, trivially true? Let me answer that for you. Yes, it does. Of course it does. Personal tastes and preferences are unimportant in the great scheme of things. But here, we're not talking about living colour. We are addressing an area of truth, of knowledge, of scholarship, of experience, somewhere between living colour and the atomic weight of carbon. Before I go into that, though, I want to talk about scholarship and the humanities. One thing I find very, excuse me, one thing I find very revealing in your video is the description you give of your appreciation of scholarship in the humanities and the social sciences, and the determination you make of what constitutes good and bad scholarship in those areas. I'm really glad that you're more open-minded towards the humanities than some who work in STEM. But I do have some observations about your allyship, if I can call it that. What you seem to be saying is that humanities scholarship, by which I mean the production of knowledge, a practice that requires something like truth, humanities scholarship is only valid if it conforms to the processes and principles of empiricism. The examples you offer, the books you held up, draw specifically on methods such as data analysis to further their propositions and it is this adherence to empiricism which is seen as granting these propositions a truth value. This is good humanities scholarship because it conforms to the epistemology of empiricism. You also critique at least some writings in the humanities which, from the perspective of empiricism, fails as scholarships. Perhaps by not generating testable hypotheses, but also perhaps by not necessarily conforming to a level of apparent clarity which is supposedly valued in the sciences. It's this scholarship which operates differently to empiricism which you seem to be discounting and which I want to talk about here because it's in this area that Peterson is, I believe, working. Now firstly, a few words about obscurantism. Sometimes it's just obscure, bad writing. But sometimes it's that the, there needs to be a certain amount of jargon or technical usage within any, any discipline that outsiders might not be familiar with. 
and that's true in any field including the sciences, of course. Now I'm not familiar with Karen Barrett's work, you cite that you hold it as an example as ba of bad and obscure writing, but to be honest, I didn't have particularly difficulty understanding the excerpt you read out. I can't judge the overall quality of the text, but I didn't find that section willfully, willfully obscure, probably because it's written in a style that I'm familiar with. Now, does this mean that it's a case of style over substance? Maybe, but maybe not. And sometimes style and substance aren't so easily distinguished. I think it's worth saying that something a little about clarity here as well. Some philosophers, as you probably know, would argue that clarity in writing or in speech is not always the desirable good it appears to be. Much can be hidden in the plain sight of clear language, and the idea that language is a transparent medium that, if used correctly, that is, clearly, leads to an uninterrupted view of the truths revealed through that usage, is itself worthy of critique. As you will know yourself, plain speaking, which is often an appeal to common sense, is also often just dumbing down, a way of denying complexity. A lot of pop science is extremely clear, erasing ambiguity and uncertainty to the point of being flat out wrong. So we have to be careful with clarity. Unnecessary clarity can also extinguish differences of privileging those who share the common sense that generates that sense, that feeling of clarity. Some popular theology and popular political writing is extremely clear, making appeals to those who share that vision that allows them to see the truth unproblematically revealed by the simple words and short sentences. Sometimes what appears to be obfuscation or impenetrability in language is actually an attempt to recognise that clarity can deceive and to force the reader to stay with the unavoidable slipperiness of language, perhaps requiring them to do the necessary work of reading in a more complex sense, in the sense of being aware of their own meaning-making processes, perhaps overturning familiar, clearer, more common-sense readings in favour of others, perhaps recognising the poetics at work in the processes of their understanding. Can scholarship that recognises the limitations of language and works with those limitations really generate knowledge? Of course it can. And a lot of scholarship in the humanities works in just that way. And if it can produce knowledge, then something truthful is being stated, even if it's addressing questions for which there are no empirical answers. So, non-empirical methods of scholarship can produce truth, and the expression of that scholarly activity may involve a use of language that is specialist and difficult to access, and maybe one that is easy to parody, unfortunately. Scholarship in the humanities tends not to be heavy on living colour, although I'm sure there are a few articles out there. It does include, however, work on important themes of morality, on the limits of knowledge, on value, and on meaning. Is there a better epistemology available to determine the atomic weight of carbon, or the structure of the smallpox virus and scientific empiricism? Can scholarship and humanities do that? Of course not. And whilst Peterson is at best vague on the subject, I don't think he believes that either. Are there truths out there which are more important than those which can be determined only through empiricism? Of course, and we live according to the recognition of those truths every day. How much of our day-to-day -day life is spent considering the empirical status of the actions we carry out? None. Most of our actions are motivated by beliefs about the world, about our loved ones, about other people, for which there is no empirical evidence, and yet which we hold to be true and act as if true. Is living colour really a great band? Did you really enjoy yourself at that gig? Can you provide empirical evidence of these claims? It would be pointless to try. What do we do with all these aspects of our personal, social, cultural and, model and moral lives that are not amenable to scientific study? What do we do with questions of value, questions of meaning? 
what do we do with statements that are, by their nature, non-universal? Statements about this person, these people at this time, in this place, within this social setting. These are typically the domain of the humanities, of philosophy and of the arts. And while some of that scholarship might have overlap with the stable and physical domain of the sciences via techniques such as data analysis, most will not. We could, of course, say these field, fields don't deal with truth or real knowledge, but this would mean we have to surrender the notion of truth as we use it in our day-to-day -day lives. Those likings and dislikings, the moral choices we make, the values we give to this experience and not to that, the actions we take based on these choices and beliefs, all of this, we would have to say, is not based in truth because it lacks an empirical basis. Do we really want to sacrifice that much truth and grant the honour of being true only to science, an activity which, by its own tenets, can only ever be true enough. Is that good enough for us? And what about moral truths, which is where we came in? Are these trivial? Does the fact that it may be impossible to ground moral statements in scientific epistemology render them insignificant? Peterson would say, absolutely not and instead would say that a person who acts in a moral way, that is, in accordance with moral facts, is better aligned with the truth than one whose actions are driven only by rational, that is, empirically verified reasons. How those moral facts are derived will not be determined by the scientific method, but by honest questioning of meanings and values, and may well be expressed in language that might, of necessity, be unclear, ambiguous, and at times positively opaque. Nevertheless, this is the work of philosophy, of humanities, and of the arts, the recognition of the myths we live by, and, of, and an observing of when those myths fail. The myths of scientific realism fails when it generates truths that are at variance with the greater truths of morality and meaning. This, I suggest, is what Jordan Peterson means when he says that empirical truths are nested in moral truths, and it is statements of moral truth that Peterson is aiming to make. To the extent that he succeeds in expressing these statements, I assert that Jordan Peterson does indeed speak the truth. Okay, thanks very much for watching and participating, Philip, and I'll see you on the flip side. Bye.